previously on Test Your Might. It's been one lost year. Being suffocated by a horde of video games stacked to the fucking ceiling. Just as well this whole thing collapsed on me. What the? I must be dreaming. Not working. Come on! I can't wake up. I'll just keep going. Up next, Little Nemo, Green Master. Little Nemo, the Dream Master, is a true classic from Capcom released on the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1990. I'm not going to sit here for an hour and gush about this one. There are thousands of other videos on the internet that will document how Winsor McKay's turn of the 20th century comic strip was brought to a young millennial generation by way of Japan. Just know that I think the world of this game from its visual and audio representation to its gameplay. <laughs> Funny how people in my waking life say I'm negative and I never like anything. Guess they should ask me about 30-year-old Capcom games more often. Anyway, there is one thing that always comes up when discussing Little Nemo. It's that the public widely believes it's one of the harder games for the NES. I think they are really underestimating how hard some NES games get. That's not to say it doesn't deserve the moniker NES Hard, a nebulous term I could do a whole video on. Just that its difficulty is overrated. Then and now, Little Nemo, the Dream Master, is an article I pulled from the game's wiki and it echoes the cry of many that this game is frustratingly cheap and assumed too much from the player. Much of this anguish comes from Nemo not having a battery backup for saves or a password system, noting that this is particularly egregious because of the game's base difficulty. I admit, that is one of the characteristics of a game being NES hard, but even noting that deficiency, there are a few things that really keep it from that upper echelon status. It has extra lives, forgiving life bar systems, health pickups, infinite continues, and mostly consistent parameters. The level design, with one exception, is really spectacular, featuring hints given by NPCs that reliably direct the player, something not always a given back then. It simply can't be considered one of the elites of difficulty, not even for the system. While the article believes that the game's enemy placement is cheap, I disagree. There are a few times that unseen enemies can really ruin your day, but for the most part, there is an appropriate flow to it. I also don't think that Little Nemo assumes too much of the player at all. The puzzles presented throughout the game are not that taxing. Instead, I believe it's perfect to cut your teeth on if you want to start testing your skills, or if you are younger and have a difficult time understanding why we old farts and hipsters like these 8-bit games. I'll admit that not anyone off the street can beat Little Nemo, but I truly believe if you are physically capable, with enough practice, this game is in your grasp. It does have some of those Nintendo hard qualities, it is also an average example of what would be expected out of a game of value and worth of the time. Which yes, means it had to have a sharp enough edge to cut through many playthroughs. Most of those sharp edges lie in the enemy and level designs, with a few rather infamous examples. One of the most classically difficult things about Little Nemo is its infinite enemy respawn rate. Regardless of how many times they are dispatched, they just keep coming. This is a legitimate sign of a difficult game, but it's also a common trope of the day that was dealt with in the titles of various quality and skill level. In Nemo, this may seem doubly difficult as the player has no offensive attacks for most of it, instead only throwing candy which temporarily stuns enemies. However, this candy also tames friendly critters, and while even some of these are passive, most do offer offensive maneuvers. Once the player learns which of Nemo's buddies is best for each scenario, enemies, though numerous, are dispatched with negligible trouble when wielded effectively. Well, except one. There's a very notorious foe in this game, the legendary Float Fiend. These dandelion seeds aren't looking to grant any wishes and have a very pervasive attack pattern. They float in the direction of Nemo until they are above, then they will begin to descend steadily. If Nemo moves in either direction, the spore will follow and always drops when it gets a certain amount of pixels above his head. They have to be handled as if on a metronome. Ignore them, continue on the way without hesitation, and as soon as they get directly above Nemo, stop, let them hit their point of no return, then keep moving. Simple, right? Nah, very much easier said than done. 
Novice players often have trouble jumping and raising elevation while being chased by the float fiends. That is one of the worst things to do and treating them rhythmically and keeping them above is about the best advice I can give. Not insurmountable, but NES hard indeed. Just like in Fantasia, Nemo must search each stage to find a set number of keys to advance. I guess we're all looking for things we lost. Unlike Fantasia, finding all the missing keys is absolutely necessary. The obvious design goof is the only way for the player to know the first time through how many keys they need is by making their way to the door and hoping like hell that they do. If any lock remains, they must return to search for more. I'll definitely give a point to the public on this one. That is not the most direct way to give the player this info at all. Otherwise, the stage design does present puzzles by hiding these keys behind using the abilities of the different animals Nemo can befriend. This very Capcom-esque mechanic is well implemented and several brain twisters will be incorporated this way. However, I don't think they are excessively difficult by any means. Sometimes they may be used to throw the player off, but how many times would it take you to choose the bee over the frog in this scenario? Also subverting the difficulty of this as a whole is that in one stage there are more keys than needed, and in another they are grouped together. Not exactly Sherlock Holmes shit here. By far, the most well-known stage in this game is the third, House of Toys. It requires quick thinking and even quicker reflexes as this stage takes place on the back of a train as the level scrolls by. Often termed an auto-scroller, the player must guide Nemo on a fixed portion of the train as the enemies and obstacles whiz past. There are toy planes that have predictable dive bomb patterns. Hot air balloons who appear on schedule but drop multiple bombs erratically. Flying squirrels zoom towards Nemo in a straight line at a set altitude when triggered. There are spikes, both fixed and crushing. Blocking walls are also added to the mix, requiring proper jumping and ducking alternatively. There is barely time to think as the train barrels past power-ups that must be grabbed or let go depending on the situation. Getting at least some will be crucial though as the stage has no checkpoints and must be completed in one life each time. It is a fantastic test of gaming metal. I must be dreaming because when I'd recorded this footage, I did the sequence in one try and never looked back. If the game ended after the first seven stages, it wouldn't even qualify for this show. The first two are very easy, House of Toys needs only to be mastered once, and the other four stages, while sometimes long, aren't really anything that special. However, the game really tightens up when Nemo gets to Nightmare Land. Here he is tasked with vanquishing the Nightmare King himself and may now use the scepter he has been carrying around all goddamn game. Just because Nemo now has offensive capabilities in the form of a melee attack and a chargeable projectile, that doesn't decay the challenge a bit. Stage 8 has 7 sections with two mini bosses and the final showdown with the King. This must all be done on one continue even though there's a checkpoint after each boss. While this is a tall order, I would remind the audience that this is definitely something common back in the day where the final stage is as long or longer than the entire game itself. This is especially so in Capcom titles. Again, if someone were attempting to get into hard ass games, this run to me is a superb introduction as the platforming here is tough but fair and throws a good challenge even if the bosses are relatively easy to defeat. The player will need to use all they have learned on the previous seven stages about platforming with each critter as there are several jumps that must be performed while riding. Overall, plenty of perfect jumps and leaps of faith are required. There is even a particular one that I think might be the single biggest hurdle in the entire game. The screen after Nemo defeats the Penguin King mini-boss, he must ride a lizard and jump from this platform down to this one. Grasping the lower wall with the wall walking ability, as the jump is just barely strong enough to reach. This right here with its dual float fiends and exact precision needed to grasp the wall has probably done more to sour this game's reputation than anything else. The aforementioned Penguin King is the first mini boss and has some very basic attack patterns by throwing out three or fewer minions and blowing a few bubbles that fall down on the player in a typical rain pattern. The only thing slightly out of the ordinary about this is how Nemo must charge and shoot diagonally. The Manta boss is the hardest in the game, he has some wicked randomness to his movements, but his offensive abilities are low as they seem to never directly target Nemo, instead any area on the screen rather haphazardly. Reflexes must be quick to avoid them, but it's never overwhelming. The Nightmare King will seem easy after the player has invested the time needed to run the stage that precedes him, and the designers graciously load up the extra lives right before battle. 
the blobby fires needs to be handled with urgency as they can come back to literally bite Nemo in the ass, but his other attack just requires focused reflexes to thwart. I'll admit, at the end of the day, making difficulty distinctions between games is often like comparing losing a boxing match to an amateur boxer or Mike Tyson. To the untrained, it's going to be very hard to tell the difference between those two ass whoopings. But that is the aim of this show to qualify what is difficult and to see how difficult stacks against difficult. Little Nemo, while it does have a slobber knocker of a final stage, for the most part is an even killed experience that is indicative of its time. It doesn't hold the player's hand, but it also doesn't beat them into submission. Therefore, it receives a stone designation for difficulty, as one of the harder games ever made, just not quite as legendary as its reputation boasts. Okay, this is where I started getting comments like this. And uh, I beat this game as a kid, and I had no idea of its reputation until much, much later when I had a neighbor, friend, and fellow collector who told me how hard he thought it was. Years before I ever started a web show, I took that game from him in the afternoon and beat it by the evening, and when I brought it back, he was more than a little frustrated with me. Just as there's some hard games that we beat as children, there's also some games that we paint as giants in our minds. But sometimes they may be more like paper tigers than we realize. <laughs> Thanks for watching, and you'll see me next time on Test Your Might. That does remind me of another game I couldn't beat when I was a kid. Hey, I think I'm starting to wake up. What a dream. I'm glad that's over. Cut, print, and whatever. You broke something.